How many people were at the event last night? Oh, so um, practically a clean sweep. Well, um, as you know then, I'm an inveterate talker and it doesn't take much to set me off and it takes quite a bit to turn me off. So it seems to me these things are always more interesting if they're driven by the concerns of the audience. And if the concerns of the audience aren't sufficient to fill the time, well, then I have a whole laundry list of obsessions that we can work our way through uh, uh, till the last syllable of recorded time, <laughs> since that's not far away, in my opinion. Um, Very little of what I planned to say last night got said because whenever I discover that I'm going to have to stand at a podium rather than sit in a chair, I can't, because of my contact lenses, glance down at my notes comfortably. So instead, I just sort of rave. So I appreciated the enthusiasm of the audience last night. I My personal assessment of the talk was that it was an even more than usual meandering diatribe. And uh, a critic who charged me with uh, a basic incoherence would probably get my uh, blushing acquiescence. Maybe we can do better today. Are, are there questions uh, from last night? At the time, I, did, I wasn't aware of any kind of discontinuity, but I was thinking about it later. Mm, me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to know, um, what's uh, the, the continuity between what you were saying at the beginning about um, changing the way we are in relationship to the earth and consuming less resources, and then what you were saying toward the end about um, the coming of the millennium and moving out of the birth canal into a new reality. Yeah. Right. No, I think that there is, a, a, if not a contradiction there, at least uh, uh, it's some kind of uh, coincidence of opposites. I, what I don't want to say is that there's nothing to be done that there is no moral or political imperative and that we can just continue with this mindless potlatch civilization until everything is ruined because I don't think, I don't believe that and I think it's socially irresponsible to say that. On the other hand, I, what I don't want to fall too much in the other direction toward is saying that it all depends on us and that we must raise enormous levels of anxiety in ourselves and uh, act as though the salvation of the planet depended on us. It, what more is happening is that the most important political work that needs to be done is for each of us to raise our own consciousness about these issues and then uh, to create a community based on the sum total of our personal acts of reformation. So, you know, it is very important to uh, uh, bring help to people in the third world who are struggling to raise families and preserve their environments and this sort of thing. But if I were a rationalist, I would be completely despairing. So we are more in the role of like midwives of this new order. It, and I guess it's useful then to return to that birth metaphor. The birth of the new humanity and the new earth is going to happen. But in the same way that a midwife or, or an obstetrician can ease a birth, make it smoother, make it less painful for all concerned. That's the role that political activism needs to take. So I think we should uh, act as though the salvation 
of the earth is on our shoulders, but feel as though it is an automatic unfolding that we need not uh, have anxiety about. You know, the Chinese philosopher Wei Po Yang said, uh, worry is preposterous. And I think that's true. Uh, we don't know enough to worry. And to, to worry is, in a sense, a kind of act of hubris because you are claiming complete knowledge of the situation and then you worry. And so what is much more empowering and what makes the, the process of historical ending easier, I think, is to act from your heart and to individual acts of caring are more important than grandiose, than giving your energy to grandiose political schemes. I mean, it almost comes back down to the, to the gospel admonition to, you know, heal the sick, clothe the naked, visit the imprisoned, bury the dead. But there's nothing there about grandiose political reform and all that sort of thing. That, I think, arises out of the zeitgeist of the collectivity. And I'm very hopeful. People have a sort of hear my rap differently. I mean, I've had people after what I thought were inspiring panegyrics come up to me and say, but it's such a dark and horrifying vision. It means that I failed as a communicator in that situation because I'm the gonest and most irrational hope freak I've ever met. I mean, I think everything is fine. Everything is going toward the purpose for which it was intended, but it's an act of conscious awareness on the part of each of us that carries us toward that. So, you know, often in what I say, there is, if not the fact of contradiction, then the appearance of contradiction. This is because, to my mind, life is complicated enough to admit of contradiction. Was it Oscar Wilde or who was it who said, I contradict myself? I contradict myself. <laughs> um, logical consistency is one of the, the prejudices that we've inherited from the scientific attempt to describe the world. But in fact, even science at its basic level has now abandoned that as an ideal. In quantum physics, the way it's done mathematically is you have an ordinary causal logic, uh, an if-then logic, but in order to handle what quantum physics is attempting to describe, you also have to have what are called islands of Boole or islands of Boolean logic which is embedded in the standard logic and which is a logic of both and. And you cannot reduce this to a non-contradictory description. The great thing about the rational program of science is pushed far enough, it reveals the irrational foundations of nature. And that's really what the crisis in science now is. The, the, cutting edges of physical science have contacted the Heisenberg uncertainty principle in the 20s, the anthropocentric principle in the, in the 80s and 70s, and uh, we are realizing that somehow the notion of an observer outside the system with a godlike objectivity and uh, zero input into the situation. That was a necessary fiction for the more naive program of description of nature. But as we move into the more sophisticated description of nature, we have to place the observer in the picture and then there is going to be a, a reverberation of contradiction that is... Uh, uh, probably can't be gotten rid of. 
I mentioned a little, or I referred to this in the talk last night, where I said we shouldn't push for closure. We should accept that it is in principle mysterious. And so we are never explaining life or relationships or economies or whatever we're looking at. We're describing them with ever more prescient accuracy. But, but we cannot uh, eliminate the unknown. One of my teachers years ago, West Churchman, wrote a wonderful book called Planning on Uncertainty. And I think, you know, we all need to plan on uncertainty. And it's the one thing that is left out of most models because the model builder has such faith in the model that he would never build in a trap door into the realm of uncertainty. And yet life is composed almost entirely of these kinds of trap doors, you see. Does that do it? So, do I understand then that um, in, in your vision, uh, we really don't know anything about what it's going to look like once we're out of the birth canal, but what we can do now is behave with integrity toward the world that we're in today. Is that right? That's right. And it's not that in principle we can't know what it's like out beyond the birth canal. It's simply that it's too early. I used the metaphor last night of that the transcendental object is below the event horizon. It is. And so all we can see is the rosy glow of its promise at this point. But give us ten years and the actual edge of the transcendental object will rise above the event horizon. I mean, I don't think that we are marginalized or uh, part of fad and fashion. I think this is actually the rising modality necessary for the future if we're going to make it through. In other words, I suspect that 10 years from now, 15 years from now, the things we are talking about today will be the general metaphors and concerns in society because I'm, I just have a very strong intuition based on, you know, uh, a lot of journeying into those hyperspatial modalities that uh, this is the path. And I'm sufficiently convinced of that to submit it to a kind of intellectual plebiscite I mean, I believe that ideas compete with each other the way animals compete in an environment and that the best ideas, the most fitting ideas for the human adventure will, will uh, eliminate their competition. And that's what we're experiencing now in, in the political domain is the competition between... Uh, ideological systems roughly comparable to dinosaurs and mammals. And, you know, you can decide which is which, but the two are incommensurate and, and one is in the act of eliminating the other. And so it's a matter of uh, observing this process, understanding it, and being comfortable with it. If you're right, I don't think you need to feel any urgency because uh, that will quite naturally percolate out uh, in the mix. Many of you have heard me quote William Blake. It's always worth repeating. He said, if the truth can be told so as to be understood, it will be believed. In other words, understanding compels belief. You don't have to hammer on somebody. Your task is to refine your message into an understandable form and then let the dynamics of intellectual competition decide uh, what is the best model to, to follow. Yeah. Uh, I had a question related to what you were just saying and then I had a chemistry question. Uh, what keeps me optimistic is that information seems to be spreading more rapidly. And some futurists have said that by the year 2011, that information will be doubling every second. 
was wondering if you could comment on that. Well, yeah. I mean, I uh, part of what I was going to talk about last night and get, didn't get to is uh, I'm the purveyor of a very formal mathematical theory about how history unfolds itself and what time is. And to your great good fortune, you're not going to be exposed to this today. Had we two days, I would uh, 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 flay you with it on the second day. But here's the thing that's going on. Since the very first moments of the universe's existence, uh, novelty as I call it, or complexity, as someone else has called it, or connectedness, has been increasing. So that the, the early universe was very simple. It was a, a plasma of free electrons. There were no laws of molecular physics, still less laws of, uh, of biology or gene segregation or something like that. As the universe has aged, it has become more and more complex. We represent the culmination to the present moment of that process. Well, I don't think that's particularly big news. It's sort of a stating of the obvious that the universe has grown more complex through time. But what is interesting is that each advancement into complexity that has built on the previously established foundation of complexity occurs more rapidly than the stages which preceded it. So if you were to draw a diagram of that, it would be an involuting spiral. So that after the Big Bang and, it's, and things settled down after the first few nanoseconds of the universe's existence, well then for a long time it was very boring. And all that happened was that temperatures fell very gradually. Eventually they fell to the point where uh, atoms could settle down into stable orbits around nuclei. And then as it fell, as the temperature fell still further, eventually these atoms could aggregate into molecular structures. Again, each advancement into novelty proceeding more rapidly than the stage which preceded it. Well, that's why, to my mind, human history is not a radical break with primate biology. It simply represents an acceleration of primate behavior into a more compacted temporal domain and uh, high technology, electronic data transfer, the erection of global society which has built on the previous levels of cultural attainment has happened even more quickly so that these eras or epochs you could almost think of them as of complexity are now of such short duration that instead of taking millions of years or perhaps billions of years to to transit through one of these we now are moving through them at the rate of a, uh, one or two a decade and beyond that, one or two every two or three years. And beyond that, one or two every few months. And I see no elegant reason for assuming that this process will ever cease its asymptotic acceleration. Well, then, if you picture what I'm describing, it's a funnel of some sort, which begins with an extremely wide mouth but which has now narrowed to an extremely um, small and fast-moving kind of situation. And this is why history is a self-limiting process. It isn't that we have broken away from the, the uh, slow-moving processes of ordinary nature. It's that we represent nature 
at a different time frame. And I think this is why history is ending, because it's going so much faster than it used to go that it's going to finish very soon. There may be as much experience ahead of us as there is behind us, but we're moving through it so much faster than we used to that we may we are literally approaching the end of time at a faster and faster speed and uh, this is something built into the structure of the cosmos it's the answer to the question where did we come from we were called forth out of biological organization by the continued acceleration of the expression of novelty and and this is why I count myself as a proponent of what I call the big surprise rather than the big bang the big surprise lies ahead of us not billions of years or millions of years or thousands of years in the future but within our lifetimes potentially uh, and it's interesting, the, I think I said this last night, the people who run the world now possess curves which when they draw these curves and try to extrapolate them 50 years into the future, it makes no sense at all. You cannot extrapolate uh, the ozone hole, the AIDS epidemic, the pl spread of pluton you cannot extrapolate these things a hundred years into the future because they all go asymptotic and reach infinity so it means the oceans boil the atmosphere blows off everybody dies and that's the end of it but I don't think that's what's happening I think novelty is the saving grace and that we are the historical adventure is essentially coming into the finale of the third act and it is our great good fortune to be spectators and participants in the phenomena that for all preceding generations could only be anticipated uh, and, uh, and prayed for. It's a screwy position, I understand. I mean, boiled down to a bumper sticker, it's a bearded guy on the corner with a sign which says repent for the end is nigh or maybe just the end is nigh but I think all the evidence is that uh, the soul is about to collectively leave the body the human imagination married to technology has become a force too powerful to be unleashed within the fragile ecosystem of this planet. So we must either carry ourselves elsewhere or the planet's homeostatic drive to preserve ordinary biology will eliminate us through epidemic disease or climatological upheaval or, you know, the, there are many possibilities. So I think we are being propelled somewhat reluctantly into a new human modality that is as radical a shift as birth is to the individual or as the original entry into history was for our species. History cannot be conceived of as preceding another thousand or ten thousand years. I mean, it, it just can't be. So it must be that it's a self-limiting process. And it only lasts 25,000 years. I mean, if you go back 25,000 years, the Earth was in ecodynamic balance. Human beings were fully established as intelligent, as caring, as creative as you and I. Uh, theater, poetry, dance, love, hope, tragedy, religion, all these things were in place. But history represents uh, Gaia hitting the fast forward button on the evolution of the primates and it, it seems of long duration to us because we at the level of the expression of the individual phenotype are as ephemeral as mayflies 
You know, a person lives 70 years, 90 years, and then they're gone. But on a scale of, of 25,000 years, clearly what is happening on this planet is the emergence of an entirely new kind of order within the natural order. It is natural, but it is new. There is no contradiction in this. Once atoms were a new invention, once molecules were a new invention, once polymers were the cutting edge of what's happening, now the cutting edge of what's happening is large-scale primate machine integrated societies based on the movement of information. Did that do it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you want to follow on? Just, no, a quick chemistry question. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, is 5-methyl-oxy-NN-dimethyltryptamine crystalline legal to possess? And would one, for, if one was going to mix it, would one mix it with harming, harmello, uh, heroline, or heroline, or harmaline? <laughs> that was a word salad. Um, <laughs> Well, I think you're asking about 5-MeO-DMT, 5-methoxy-dimethyltryptamine, the toad foam of recent fame. Uh, as far as I understand, I think that it's legal. However, it would probably depend on the length of the fangs of the local DA because there is what's called the Cogener Law which says that structural near relatives of hallucinogens can also be prosecuted as illegal compounds. As far as the question about the harmine alkaloids, harmine, harmaline, tetrahydroharman, harmelo, I think is apocryphal, uh, specious. The, but the notion which must lie behind your question is harmine alkaloids inhibit monoamine oxidase, which is an enzyme system in the human gut that tends to inactivate um, amines, monoamines, of which these hallucinogens all, most all fall into that category. Uh, you could attempt to inhibit your MAO with a harmine, with a dose of harmine or harmaline, and then smoke 5-MeO DMT. But I, I don't recommend this unless you are a pharmacologist with hours and hours of psychedelic flight time on your log. And this is certainly nothing for the ingenue to attempt. Once you, once you get out into the realm of synergies, that means what happens when you run two metabolically active compounds at the same time, and some people do three and four and five, you know, you're definitely on your own because <laughs> pharmacology doesn't study drugs like that. They study them in isolation, their activity. And, you know, some people say of the smokable tryptamines, they're so quick that wouldn't it be logical to inhibit your MAO in order to freeze frame the experience and instead of having it last three minutes, have it last 30 minutes. Yes, that's a fine idea, but what if it lasted 30 hours instead? I mean, you, you don't, you know, a miss is as good as a mile in this game, so you should be, have your mantras ready if <laughs> you push off uh, into that. Yeah. Quick and easy question. Okay, I imagine psilocybin is probably, you know, pretty common in pretty common use, and I'm sure that the people around here are pretty aware of the malathion spraying that's going on. And I've always been curious. Uh, I'm not a chemistry student, but since psilocybin does have a phosphorus in it, and I know most of the of malathion and most of the other chemicals like it are organophosphates, and they react synergistically. Is there a possibility of a synergistic toxicity when you get, you know, a, a dose of malathion and you're using psilocybin? Well, 
every once in a while these kinds of questions come along and the answer is always since research with psilocybin is illegal or and even in rats counterproductive to your career uh, nobody knows uh, you mentioned the phosphorus group in psilocybin psilocybin is 4 phosphoryloxy and then dimethyltryptamine this is very interesting to me because uh, and we don't have to spend too much time on this but but it's the only for substituted indole in nature on this planet. The only for substituted indole in nature on this planet. Well, this is suggestive to me of a possible extraterrestrial origin for this molecule because the way evolution works is from one structure, <clears throat> you elaborate another structure, and then near cousins of that appear, and so forth and so on. The, the phosphorus group in the four position on psilocybin sticks out like a sore thumb uh, when you look at the structure of organic nature. Too much that malathion is a phosphorylated compound. Um, I was interesting, I noticed in Hoffer and Osmond's hallucinogens, malathion is occasionally, there are known cases of human abuse of malathion. It causes severe dream disturbances. I, I can tell you that from experience. And, and is, is there a bigger debt to pay at the dose where it does that? In other I, words... I don't know. I've, you know, not, not by the aerial spraying, but accidentally working with it, you know, and fairly concentrated. Uh, I've gotten it on my skin, and for several days I had very disturbed dreams and you know, broken sleep, and I think that that's, it's pretty well reported that that's not uncommon at all. Well, that's very interesting. Uh, because it's a neurotoxin, it also creates a neural disturbance. You know, I'm willing to, to buy into the notion that all drugs are poisons at certain doses, all substances are poisons at certain doses. I mean, you can kill yourself with common salt if you eat three pounds of it. That's all she wrote for you. So uh, always what you're doing is you're perturbing the dynamic of ordinary functioning. And then you want to, and then what you're watching is the, is the chemical cascade that returns you to equilibrium. Mm -hmm. which is um, a, psychedelic, a psychedelic type of compound used in many cultures, but never really with much pleasure. I don't think um, many cultures actually would posit that uh, jimson weed, for instance, is, a, is an enjoyable high. So it may give you psychedelic experiences, it may give you vivid dreams, but it's not um, something that many people would volunteer to take. Drugs of that type. Yeah, well, that's something worth talking about, and certainly I found it true the notion of intoxication is an incredibly uh, culture-bound idea. And what one culture considers an acceptable intoxication, another culture just regards as an incredibly unpleasant experience. Uh, alcohol in high doses is not something most rational people would care to repeat, I think, unless there were cultural conditioning pushing you toward that, or tobacco. I mean, essentially, that's an experience of toxicity. And until you build up uh, uh, tolerance to the more toxic aspects of tobacco, every time you smoke it, you turn green and become nauseated. We had the experience in the Amazon, there was, for years, my brother and I pursued a hallucinogen called ukuhe that was uh, in use in a very restricted area by three tribes of Indians. And the reason we were interested in it is because the ethnographic literature said that the shamans used it to talk to little men. And because we had encountered in the DMT flash these things that I've called self-transforming machine elves, 
we were interested in an aboriginal hallucinogen that would let you talk to little people of some sort and the chemistry of these things was known uh, of the ukuhe gradually became known in the 70s and it was made from the resin of a certain tree which elaborated not only DMT, which is a clean, fast-acting psychedelic tryptamine, but also a number of other tryptamines. And, you know, after immense expense and physical wear and tear, we, on the upper Yaguas Yasu drainage in Peru, we actually contacted people who knew how to make this hallucinogen. And, you know, we thought it was going to hurl open the doorway to the golden realm. And when we finally got to the bioassay of it, which is a, a term which means getting loaded on it, um, <laughs> it was really tough to take this stuff. And, you know, your heart felt like it was just going to hammer its way out of your chest. And there were sweat. And, and there was hallucination, but my God, you were monitoring so many other physiological systems going into crisis that, uh, uh, you know, it seemed uh, almost ancillary. So then, you know, live through it. The next morning, troop down to the shaman's hut and say, you know, listen, Basilia, we, we have to talk. And, uh, and then him saying, well, yeah, it takes getting used to. <laughs> and, you know, that's why our shamans don't live very long. <laughs> and, and so then you, you realize, aha, uh -huh, what we're dealing with here is a culture that has sanctioned this experience and projected a lot of cultural baggage onto it, but that if you're the unsold customer, you say, you know, I, I think once is enough. Thank you for that. A more familiar case that I think is similar, although some people rise up in holy wrath and we get into great arguments about this, but my personal opinion is that Amanita muscaria, do you all know what that is? It's the red mushroom uh, of European folk mythology in German. It's called the Fliegenpilz. It's, uh, it's, atropenic too. it's atropenic too. Well, a lot of people who never got loaded on it spewed a lot of scholarly argument about how this was a wonderful shamanic intoxicant. But I submit to you in most cases it comes closer to being an ordeal. And it, it may be that because of genetic variation, seasonal variation, individual variations in the expression of its genome, edaphic factors, meaning the soil that it grows in, uh, the nature of its mycorrhizal relationship, and in other words, we've staked out here about an eight variable equation relative to Amanita muscaria, that sometimes it's wonderful. But unless you have always been in that area and can draw on the shamanic lore of great tradition about it, I think just going out into the woods and faunching down on the first Amanita muscaria that you come upon is probably a ticket to the emergency room uh, if, you're, if you're not very careful. Uh, in Madagascar, there are no uh, hallucinogens as we would understand it, but there are what are called um, ordeal poisons. This is an entire category in Madagascan Aboriginal shamanism. What's going on here, uh, there, is there are these plants which the, you take them and you at first assume you're going to die because you feel so bad. And then you feel so bad that you beg to die. <laughs> and then you don't die. And you recover completely within 10 to 12 hours. And you are so damn glad to be alive that this has all the characteristics of a psychedelic experience. I mean, you come down a kinder, gentler, more attentive, more decent human being. But it's only because you've been hurled 
into the jaws of death itself and then brought back. That will work, folks. <laughs> but so my my interest has always been to to squeeze the definition of psychedelic, to narrow it, to make it more precise. I mean, sometimes people say, well, you're, you're, it's about altered states. Well, there are all kinds of altered states, thousands of altered states. Without even talking about drugs, we can talk about uh, uh, being in love, being abandoned in love, uh, being jealous, being anxious about your financial situation, uh, suddenly seeing the, your roots in high Atlantis. These are all altered states. None of them are psychedelic. Well, then you move into the realm of drugs. There are, as you mentioned, atropine states, tropane-induced de uh, uh, deliriums, the uh, uh, ketamine-type states, states on the edge of anesthesia, states of extraordinary agitation brought on by uh, the whole amphetamine family. All of these things are altered states, pharmacologically achieved, and to my mind, they are not truly psychedelic. What psychedelic means to me is, in structural terms, a very small number of compounds, all based on uh, on uh, I indole. The indole hallucinogens are the true psychedelics. And let's see, what are they? There aren't that many. Uh, there's LSD, which is a, a semi-synthetic, made in the laboratory, but from organic precursors, usually. LSD. Uh, Ibogaine, about which not much is known because it has never achieved much currency in the underground in this country. Psilocybin, DMT, um, and the beta-carbolines, which are monoamine oxidase inhibitors, but only hallucinogens at close to the toxic dose. And that's it. Peyote is an interesting uh, is an interesting edge situation because mescaline is not an indole; it's an amphetamine. And if you look at the the chemical pharmacological profile on peyote, it's uh, different from all these others. First of all, an effective dose of mescaline is, according to the to the literature, 700 milligrams. That's a, a pile of white powder in the palm of your hand. In other words, it's, it's, a, it's a, an inefficient drug. It puts a lot of strain on your system. There are different ways to think about toxicity. One way is to ask, how much of this compound do you have to take to experience an effect? If you have to take 700 milligrams, then it's a pretty crude uh, drug because that's a lot. On the other hand, you know, LSD is at the other end of the spectrum. Uh, you can feel quite strongly 50 gamma, 50 micrograms of LSD. Uh, help me out here. What is that? Five ten thousandths of a gram is 50 gamma. That is... To a pharmacologist, the fact that a human being can feel 50 micrograms of a compound is like a miracle. I mean, to give you an analogy so you can understand that, that's like having one red ant tear down the Empire State Building in 30 minutes. I mean, that's, that's what it looks like when 50 gamma of LSD enter your body. So. So LSD has a, an incredibly low toxicity by that measure, you see. Well, then psilocybin falls in the mid-range. Uh, it, it requires a, about 15 to 25 milligrams. And, uh, and this is an acceptable uh, situation. The other way of talking about psychedelics, rather than structurally or in terms of dose-dependent profile, 
is it's a specific altered state. It is, first of all, I like the word hallucinogen or hallucinogen. See, I grew up in a cattle town in Colorado and I haven't shed quite all of it. But hallucinogens, because I was always fascinated by the idea of hallucination. The, to me, for some reason, the idea of seeing something which is not there just became the holy grail for me because that was so challenging to my notion of what is possible. And uh, so then when we lay these indole psychedelics out in front of us and are trying to make decisions, uh, uh, many people have a great enthusiasm for LSD because it empowers thought and stirs the engines of cognition but it only reluctantly compared to these other things is a strong visionary hallucinogen you usually have to synergize it with cannabis or mescaline and then those combinations are highly visionary what i love about psilocybin is that it causes you to hallucinate so effortlessly at relatively low doses and without a lot of uh, accompanying uh, you know, sweating or tremoring or physical discomfort. And DMT is even more powerful as uh, an inducer of visionary states. Now, people who have never had a hallucination, and if you read the literature, think that a hallucination means little traveling lights or colored lines or the kinds of things you see when you press on your closed eyelids. Th those are not what I'm talking about. That kind of thing is called hypnagogia. Hypnagogia also includes chorus lines of dancing mice, little round candies, falling leaves, snowflakes. In other words, the flotsam and jetsam of the mental ocean, which is generally no more interesting than the flotsam and jetsam uh, of, of uh, the oceans of three space. What I'm interested in are full field, 360 degree visionary scenarios of jungles, deserts, ice fields, ruined cities, machinescapes, and a whole bunch of other stuff which is not so easily dropped into any category of experience that we're familiar with, but highly organized three-dimensional, self-sustaining, transformed modalities that you cannot pour language over. I mean, when you try to say what it is, all you can say is what it isn't. And I find that tremendously affirming because to me, and I guess this is important to me, that is the experience which proves that this is not self-generated. When I <clears throat> take a plant, and it shows me something I could previously not have imagined, then I know I am in the presence of the other because it couldn't have come out of me. I mean, if you insist that the volleys, that the Niagara of hallucination caused by psilocybin is generated out of the dynamics of your own psyche, if you insist that that's true, then you are unable to explain what your own psyche is. In other words, you become unrecognizable to yourself in that case. And if you are unrecognizable to yourself, you are not yourself in some sense. So I prefer to believe that it's coming from the outside, that mind is a field into which we dip the dipstick of observation, but it's not being generated in the neurons of the brain. Yeah, this guy's been waiting patiently, or perhaps impatiently. <laughs> I just have a question about one other hallucinogen. Uh, uh, I haven't heard much about uh, since the uh, late 60s, and I think the FDA took it out of the marketplace. Uh, it was the Hawaiian wood rose. Well, Do you know anything about that? Sure, yes. Um, Hawaiian wood rose, Argeria nervosa, the Argeria refers to the the silvery hairs on the underside of the leaves. It turns out that in the higher plants, 
you see LSD or its near relatives occur in ergot and are made from ergot. It doesn't occur in ergot, but it's made from ergot. Ergot is a fungi, an entirely different order of life than higher plants. But in the higher plants, uh, in the convolvulaceae, the morning glory family, there are a number of different genera that contain alkaloids that are milligram effective cousins of LSD and Argeria nervosa is the best known of these. Uh, it's also probably, I would estimate, gram for gram, probably the most concentrated natural hallucinogen on this planet because half a teaspoon is an effective dose. Where people get in trouble with baby Hawaiian woodrows is they think, oh, well, it's a plant and plants are always weak, so let's do uh, half a cup or something like that. And then, you know, you're begging for mercy in a hurry. Uh, there are 13 species of Argeria, all natives of Asia, uh, distributed from the base of the Himalayas to western Polynesia. And Argeria nervosa is simply the best known. Now, the problem with it is that, and this is something you always have to be aware of with, with plant hallucinogens, is um, that uh, cardioactive compounds occur in Argeria as well. And so if you misdose even slightly, it will put your heart through changes that will stand your hair on end. And I've never heard of anybody dying on it, but I've heard of people, you know, laying down and making their peace with their maker because they figured that they were probably going to die. Now, there are other, now, an interesting thing about Argeria nervosa is so far as we know from the ethnographic work that's been done, it is unclaimed by any aboriginal group. Uh, unless we count the surfers of Maui as an <laughs> aboriginal people. Uh, and this is fascinating to me. You know, certain plants have great antiquity of use, and other plants, equally psychoactive, are ignored. And, you know, we tend to believe that aboriginal people don't miss a trick. But occasionally it seems like they're as uh, obtuse as we are. Uh, and a couple of examples will make the case clear. Um, as you all probably know, there's quite a complex of psilocybin-containing mushrooms in central Mexico used by the, by the Mazatecan and uh, Mixtecan people there, and they seem to have exploited these mushrooms for millennia. However, on the northwest coast of North America, uh, Washington and British Columbia, where you get the northwest coast Indian groups, the Shimsham, Kwakutl, and Tlingit language areas, this is the densest concentration of psilocybin-containing species of mushrooms on this planet. And so far as we can tell, they never used them. I mean, somebody will say, well, they used them, but they never told you in the shamans. But listen, you know, a huge amount of ethnography has been done in that area. And there is not the slightest indication that these people ever utilized these mushrooms. Even though they had an advanced shamanism, plant-based shamanism, they seem to have overlooked this. Uh, another example that may have practical implications for some of the more astute among you is uh, in the past two years it's been realized that a plant which grows as a weed in the Midwest of North America um, called um, Illinois Bundle Weed, Desmanthus Illinoisensis, is in fact uh, the most concentrated source of natural DMT in the world on the root scraping of the root. And now, this one is perhaps suspect and maybe more ethnographic work seems to be done. The straight story is 
that the Indians of the Great Plains never knew about this and never utilized it. My question is, if that's so, then why is it called bundle weed? Because that seems to imply to me a medicine bundle. And, and so perhaps further ethnographic uh, excavation will show that this was used, but it could be the basis for a whole family of visionary hallucinogens that apparently were never utilized. Yeah, uh, you, yeah. Oh, um, I'd like to pull back a couple of conversations to what over the years I felt has been the focus of uh, some of your, most of your work which is essentially this realm you talk about pushing through uh, into um, this visionary world. Uh, it's a little bit, it feels to me when you talk about it, it's a little bit like taking the, the glove and turning it inside out, that possibly your, your, uh, your premises is that the universe itself is the illusion and that this visionary world is the reality that we may well be going back into that it's this material world and all the universe and uh, all the material experience that we have is really the, the other side. Well, yes. I mean, I, I, I regard myself as basically an explorer and a researcher. I have a lot more questions than answers. The thing that has made me be what I am and do what I do is because uh, the, the, what they're telling you about these states of mind are is a whitewash in that they say, oh, it gives you, and these are the pros, the, the people who are for hallucinogens say it's a form of instant psychotherapy, it's great for straightening out your relationship, it's if you're an architect, you can visualize buildings in 3D. They present it as a tool for understanding this world, its relationships, and its you know, interconnections. What I've observed is that at high doses and with sufficient intentionality, one seems to break through into what can only be honestly described as a parallel universe of some sort that has such existential presence and immediacy that it's hard to squeeze it down to being a mental construct generated temporarily in your mind through pharmacological means because it seems much more like a place. And this is incredibly challenging to our uh, way of thinking about reality because we deny the existence of these kinds of mental realms. Uh, it seems almost as though, or, or here is a model for how it might be, it seems that reality is a series of heavily compartmentalized universes of some sort, and under extraordinary situations of mental perturbation achieved by any means, uh, these membranes that keep these worlds mutually exclusive and sequestered from contamination by each other just simply dissolve and you experience what Merciliad called the rupture of plane and the rupture of plane is just like poking a hole in nearby space and then lo and behold you know the utterly unexpected is found to be alive and well right here, right now. I mean, it, and I can't stress enough how real this is and how confounding it is. I mean, I may not be the brightest person around, but I certainly have assimilated, you know, the basic shtick of what Western civilization is supposed to be about. And there is no place in the Western model of reality for the idea that just, you know, 20 heartbeats and 70 milligrams of DMT away is an elf-infested uh, <laughs> mega space of, archaeolo of, of arcology-sized dimensions. 
in which non-material beings made not of matter but of syntax are merrily pursuing uh, their own goals and possibilities. I don't know what to make of that. And I also, (laughs) almost equally puzzling as the existence of such a place, is our lack of knowledge about it when I and hundreds of other people in my experience and presumably millions of people throughout history have known that you could use plant hallucinogens to break into that world. We're living in a fool's paradise trapped inside the assumptions of linear materialism and rationalism. That's the most seductive and delicious aspect of your thesis is that, my God, there is a reality somewhere beyond that membrane and then you compound it with, with the exploration of logic or rationale where you present to us the possibility that the Big Bang is the biggest, is the most ludicrous thing to combine with rationality as could possibly be imagined. And then I've even heard people address, well, how is it possible that the vanity of the individual human being could think that he's so important that the rest of the, the galaxy, the universe out there, that we should be at all significant, whereas you say, well, hell, that's all mindscape. It doesn't exist. Or it feels like you say, well, it's, it's a mindscape. You know, it isn't. It is, it's, it's an invention. Well, wh- what I'm really saying is we know a lot less than we assume we know. I mean, if someone tells you that we live around a, a typical star at the edge of a typical galaxy strewn through a mega space trillions of times larger, I mean, they don't know what they're talking about. That's just the cheerful assurance of modern astronomy based on a bunch of fishy formulas that were cooked up uh, within the confines of the 20th century. I mean, the stars that shine down at night could be uh, painted dots on a scrim for all we know. I mean, I'm not saying that's the case, but what I am saying is... uh, I think that the greatest disservice that science has done to humankind is the marginalizing of our own importance. If we even, let's take an objective measure uh, of, uh, and uh, I think complexity, if you look around at nature, at the fossil record, at the human family, uh, complexity is clearly something very dear to nature. Nature preserves it, nature works through it, nature builds upon it. Well, uh, we're told... contains more connections per cubic centimeter than any form of matter known to exist in this cosmos. If that's true, suddenly our marginality is completely obviated and it's clear that no, we are not marginal observers of a vast cosmic drama. We are uh, at the cutting edge of the development and conservation of complexity. And it is our mind which gives us these scenarios of our, of our position in space and time. It may well be that the human mind is very, very important. The human mind represents the culmination of biology, which is another phenomenon that these astrophysicists always love to marginalize and say, oh, well, biology, it's just going on on one planet as far as we know. It could be a fluke. It may have happened once and it'll never happen again. But, you know, the life of most stars is on the order of 500 million years. We happen to have the good fortune to be in orbit around a very slow-burning, stable star And so we have ignored the fact that most stars last less than half a billion years. We can dig into the gunflint chert of South Africa and bring up fossils of of, uh, soft-bodied creatures that are close to three billion years old, six times the life of most stars in the universe. 
So when somebody's trying to tell you that what you, the universe is about is the life and death of stars, they're ignoring the fact that biology is a phenomenon as persistent as any phenomenon known to exist in the universe. And biology is not a static phenomenon. It isn't an endless recycling of, of fissionable materials the way star life is. Biological life has been steadily complexifying itself over the entire time span of its existence. So life is not marginal. Mind emerging out of life at its more complex levels of organization is not marginal. And we are not marginal. We are, I think, tremendously important in the cosmic drama and that a rational analysis of the situation will support that. Yeah. You comment in that regard. You comment on, and also you mentioned the dialogue boxes earlier, Lynn Margulis' theory that, that, that all, all of life, all of plant life is a reorganization of bacteria and all of animal life is a further reorganization of bacterial life just to get bacteria to move around from place to place. And the cerebral cortex is just a lot of that modified spirochetes that have organized themselves in a certain way. And then in, that, in, in, in my reading of her, the, the way you put human beings in this picture is that we're just an experiment in the, in the way station of bacterial life, which may or may not work. In other words, our destiny is not really in our hands. To think that we can control our fate is really hubris or, or illusion. Well, it's certainly illusion. I mean, it's pretty clear we don't control our fate. Yes, you see, one way of looking at evolution, I mean, I just offer this as a heuristic insight, is that life achieved absolute perfection with the first organism. And then this first organism underwent mutation. That's a kind of damage which it then repaired the mutation through a strategy of complexification. And then there was more mutation and more repair through complexification. So what we represent is a massive chunk of scar tissue, uh, the culmination of billions of years of repairing the perfect first life form. And all this complexity that has been added on since the first achievement is simply a response to the damage done to it by incoming cosmic radiation. I don't believe that. You see, that's a theory where you assume everything is driven by the past. I think that, uh, that what is really hanging up modern biology is its absence, its unwillingness to entertain the possibility that life is driven by purpose. This is an old chestnut in the philosophy of science. It's called the issue of teleology. Teleology is a fancy word meaning purpose. And the what happened, you see, is it's just simply a legacy of our intellectual history.